there was a there was an amount of money that was consistent from twenty to forty thousand, forty to eighty, and then eighty thousand miles and above. And uh, what what that did was we used the law of averages. Basically, a trade came in, other than body work, uh, you know, actual collision damage, and, and tires. We knew what the set reconditioning amount was going to be on every vehicle. That allowed guys out purchasing cars to buy them already knowing exactly how much reconditioning. It allowed to appraise cars knowing exactly how much reconditioning. And it allowed the service department to go ahead and fix everything. Now, there was exceptions. Obviously, you get in the vehicle, you find out it's got a bad transmission, you find something major, but there was no more, hey, I need you to approve a $4,000 service bill. We avoided vehicles getting re over reconditioned, and and over over reconditioned used cars um, is something that affects every, at least every dealership that I, I was ever involved at. Um, so kind of kind of get rid of that, and we found a way to get the speed part down. Um, the other thing is we really had to have a, a process. We we had to have steps. We had to have the cars from the second they were acquired on on this property where that car went the flow of that car had to be consistent. And, and we kind of adopted r rules where, you know, yeah, we, we had like this one lot. It was just kind of the used car, you know, auxiliary lot. And every, you know, every dealer can picture that. But you got the car that you put it back there as soon as you're taking it on trade. It sits there for a parts hold. It sits there for a detail hold. It sits there for the interior guy to come pick a, you know, fix a burn or something. It kind of stays on that same area. Well, we had to take that area and really assign it, almost almost rope it off, and we created three areas so that once that vehicle came out of intake and it was services responsibility to get the vehicle out, it didn't go back to that lot. You know, they 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 had to fix it, and the only next spot it could go was to basically the front line, which is after the pictures are taken and everything. So what what happened at that point is, is Jared created really in assembly line and he consolid consolidated all all of all of the technicians we went to a unified certification program we actually um, went into business with um, uh, easy care and became a motor trend certified dealer and what that really did for us is it created consistency in the process so every vehicle getting the same inspection every time uh, we don't do the manufacturer CPO programs anymore we do one 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 program for everything that's got under under 80,000 miles, and it's just, if it's over 80,000 miles, we do a, a road ready, which is basically a safety inspection, make sure the car um, kind of drives right. Uh, what do you think about that, Jared? Is there anything else that you can add from that from that very beginning? When I think I think those are the first two major steps that we took to at least see where any of our opportunities lie. And um, I want to add on to that and. Part of being being in the business for as long as I've been since I grew up in the business, I had a chance to sell cars. And I, when I went into the reconditioning process, it always the whole mindset of each vehicle was standing on its own two feet. And then you got charged back after you sold a car, and that was like disheartening because your commission was a little bit lower than you expected. But above anything else, I I always knew on Saturday if I had a vehicle with a check engine light. And the customer's interested in it. And I say, hey, folks, I'm going to have it taken a look at first thing Monday. Are you going to come back Tuesday to buy it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it never happened. So my goal was to make sure there was coverage till 8 o'clock at night and on Saturdays for support for the sales department. And how I portray that to all my technicians and, and the detailers and, the, and the, uh, everybody else that works for us, is unless the used car department sells a car, we don't get a chance to fix another one. And when you get the retail mindset of the department that the most important thing is being there, getting the check engine light addressed, making sure that customer doesn't leave a lot, unless they leave with a vehicle they had just purchased. So we ran into a lot of issues as far as scheduling. When we first started out, we went to a, a, a 6 a.m. till 2 p.m. shift and then a 2 p.m. till 10 p.m. And yet we we're there from 6 a.m. until 10, and what we found is by shortening the shifts in which our technicians work, um, their production fell off significantly, and it really, really wasn't that effective. So backing up to 2012, 
that was our first dabble in trying to cover the hours. And what I found is when you shorten their shift any more than that, it's really not effective. Another part of when, when we started is every time that we had a vehicle come to the lot or come through the reconditioning process, there really wasn't that much urgency. It was always, you know, we were waiting on a part from the OEM or we're waiting on this, we're waiting on that. What we got is we have two full-time parts, parts counter guys that and for our used car department, and the best thing that they do, and they're probably the best parts guys I've ever seen, they don't settle after we're making one phone call to one dealership to see if they have one part that we're interested in. It's five calls, five phone calls for a part. They go through aftermarket. They go through Napa. They go through junkyards. They go through the OEM, and they understand that the most important thing for us is time. We need to get the car to the front line. It's speed. Speed is the most important thing. Do now, we, we talk about the daily cost so they, so they know what that number yeah, is? Yeah, actually, I'll let Ricky get into this as well. So one, one of the things that we had to figure out is what is that break-even point for the cost versus the speed of a part? And so what I did is I, I kind of built a basic um, uh, equation just looking at, you know, this screenshot, we, we use a popular inventory management system that a lot of people have in the market today. And you can see what your average, you know, markup is on, on used cars in that zero to 10-day bucket. Then you can see what your average markup is on day 60. So our, our cutoff day is day 60. I expect us to, to not carry a used car past 60 days with the idea being we're going to price the car to move it by day 45. So what is the difference in, in markup between day one and between day 60? The average on you know, day one was around 2,500 bucks. Actually, let's call it day five, because our real goal was to get that average reconditioning time. When, when we first found a way to actually track the reconditioning time, which was when we implemented rapid recon, we could now see which of the steps we're taking the longest, so we can go into more of that in a little bit. But we also finally realized that the most realistic time that we could get a car to the front line was uh, about about four and a half days, and and we got to we got to 3.6, 3.7. I think it's lingering around 4.1 now. But so I'm going to calculate from day five. Let's say if the car is really available for retail sale, it's on the front line, truly on the front line, both physically and on the internet. On day five, the average markup is about $2,500. Well. On day 60, the average markup is negative $500. We've, we've got the car priced online at a loser. We're trying to move it at the wholesale price. So, so your average potential profit difference is about three grand. Divide that number by, by, by the 55 days that you truly have an opportunity to sell it, it comes out to $54 per day of potential gross profit that's on that car. So if we have a car and it's day two and they find a part, they call one place, they can get this part today, it's 100 bucks. Today you get, um, you know, let's, or let's say it's 150. Um, but do they wait for that for that hundred dollar part that they can get tomorrow? No, you want to you want to get the part today. It's actually gonna it's actually gonna save you four dollars to buy a fifty dollar more expensive part to get it hung on the car today rather than tomorrow. So speed even trumping price as long as it has you know works for what that equation that I just mentioned. So. So you have to understand what the dollar per gross profit value is. So if you look at what we're, we're really getting about an average of 800 used cars a month at $54 a day, if we could just get every car through the shop one day faster, that's a lot of gross. So, you know, for us, this was, this was big. When we first turned on Rapid Recon, now we had already changed up our whole process. We realigned the lots. We consolidated the, 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 the text. We went to a bucket system. We're working in harmony. We think we're the best in the world at this. We're rocking and rolling. We get this great tool called Rapid Recon. We turn it on. We start using it. We pull our first report. We are averaging 12 days to, to the front line. 12 days. I think Jared and I both hit our head against the desk at the same time. But you've got to be kidding me. Well, now we at least have the opportunity to look at where those gaps lie. Jared could figure out, do I need to hire another tech or do I need to hire another detailer? Come to find out, we had enough technicians. They were turning cars fast. They were getting them on their list. They were getting them out. 
problem was we didn't have enough detailers to keep up with it. Cars were sitting in detail hold for four or five days. You can find where those opportunities are to be able to really dial in. I mean, it's, it's almost like you know, picture a NASCAR that's going around a track. You know, they're, they're not just hillbillies out there with a V8 engine. No, they're fine-tuning it on every lap. They're looking at that data. And they're finding ways to improve thousands, hundreds, tens of a second, every little bit that, 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 that they can. I, I haven't found another program out there that actually allowed us to, to do that. But just like anything, it's just, it's just a tool. And it's how you use that tool. And it's what you do with that tool. It's how you implement it and make sure that the buy-in and, and the people are held accountable. So we then put basically someone in charge for every one of those steps, from the intake steps to the service inspection steps, uh, you know, to the uh, parts getting approved. There, there was somebody that it, that step started to slide from what our hourly requirements are. You could go right to one person and find out what do you need from us. You're not, you're not getting the, the, your, your step done in the right amount of time. And it wasn't talking about individual cars. It was talking about the whole speed of that step. So the whole mindset had kind of changed and the culture changed with the service department. Absolutely. Do you agree with that, Jared? Absolutely, I do. And I'm going to kind of back up. So I was talking about how we, we had a split schedule. And what we found is to cover the hours that you need to cover to, to back the, the sales department, and we had a crazy idea of having a three-day work week for our technicians. So six days a week, either it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, they are going to be working three days a week and all four days, and every six weeks they switch. What we found is we did an average of how many hours they were turning when they were working <coughs> five days a week. And then their three days of production, they are more productive than even when they were working five days a week than a normal time. And the fact of the matter is, is they, they understand that they're there a limited amount of time. They're cutting down their lunches. They're cutting down the time they spend smoking and joking outside. They cut down the time that they are wasting. And they realize they have a short amount of time. So the three-day work week has worked out so good that we have had an implementation of our, of our details. And I just want you to know, the bucket pricing for the used car department includes the mechanical service, the detail, the dents, and the touch-up. So all that's included. And 60 days after sale. Can we talk about that part? Not yet. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm jumping ahead of Jared. I'll shut up. So that's all included. That, that works fantastic. Our techs were turning a lot of hours. You know, gross was there. We found that, you know, internally we're making a lot of money as far as internal gross sales. But it wasn't speeding up the time in which they, they, they worked on the vehicles. They pull a car in, and traditionally it's a lot easier just to pull a car in and if you say, hey, I need 15 hours for today. A technician, if they have two cars, will find 15 hours a day. And if you give them two cars or, or one car, they're going to find hours that they need or the, the quota that they need to find on that vehicle. And the reason being is they're just like all of us. They're going to work their pay plan. Why would they pull in four or five cars to find those hours if they could just do it in two? So then again, we had to take another turn. And as we do the bucket pricing, the three-day work week, we have found that we had to switch our technician's mentality from being um, trying to produce hours to produce vehicles. And by that, I mean, just like the bucket-based pricing, our technicians have a certain amount of hours that are attached to that bucket. For instance, a, a vehicle that has zero to 20,000 miles is a $600 bucket that the used car department pays for that vehicle. And a technician, we pay them three hours to work on that car and fix what's wrong. Whether it takes them six hours or it takes them an hour, we pay them three hours. So they're not sitting there milking each car as it's sitting on their, on their lift. And what we have found is they are more about production-based. They are more about, I need to push as many cars into this stall, fix what's wrong, back it out, and go find another one, rather than... I just pulled this on here. I need three hours. I'm here till five. It's eleven. You know, I'm just gonna milk it. You know, I, I feel pretty good about what I got going on here. <laughs> and what we had, what we did is we retracted, just like Ricky had said before, to find the bucket based pricing system. We had to collect data for ADP or uh, whatever whatever you're using, and you have to find out hours per hour 
per mileage. And then that will give you the idea of where you're sitting as far as on, on average a vehicle with this amount of miles has this amount of hours of work done to it. And you have to work it all, clump it together so it's seamless. And then now there's no more ditching to, or between myself and my cousin Ricky as we are sales service manager and general sales manager about, you know, this. I had to justify why the vehicle needed 15 hours of work. And he's telling me I'm crazy. And then rather than go back and forth, each vehicle, it is what it is. Now, a, a technician is going to run into issues. And I want to reiterate this a couple of times. If they run into issues on vehicles, that's, their, that's how they make their living. And if they have a car that is just holding them up, it's fighting them all week, you know, and at the end of the week they have 10 hours. And, but they have been there for 50 hours. You can't just stand there and stand over top of them like it is what it is. You have to be willing when you present it to these, to these technicians, I'm going to help you. We're all going to run into issues. You're going to help them. And there's been times to it's basically a get-out-of-jail-free card. You build the culture with your technicians that they understand. They're going to find what's wrong with the vehicle, and if it's more than the hours that they're going to get paid, they're going to fix it right because we all don't want to see a car coming back three days after sale, and it looks like we did a shoddy job. So to get back to everything, get your technicians to be production-based, not hours-based. They're not have them seeking to produce cars, not find hours on cars. And that's the way in which we're moving towards it. Everything is so seam seamless that a vehicle was put, into, put on the lot. We know exactly how much is going into the car. We know exactly how many hours is going to be attached to the vehicle when it comes in. And we know just about everything that's going on to the vehicle uniformly rather than each vehicle having so many variables and not so many unknowns going on with the vehicles. So uh, that's kind of where we're at. And what we found when we went production-based, for our technicians, we were able to track that with our with rapid recon. And the the days, the amount of time it took them to finish a car, you would not believe how much it decreased. And I'd love to give you a number, but I don't have it right in front. And rapid recon not only gave us an opportunity to track the mechanical service part of it and how it decreased in time. When we did the three day work week, we have eight, eight, eight detailers that we put on the three day work week as well. And the amount of time that was shrunk on the details when we did three-day work week was significant as well. So you get to fine-tune each area. If you look at it all as this size, these vehicles are taking an overall average of five and a half days to recondition, you're missing the whole point. The whole point is to find the opportunities in which you can get better. You have to dissect each part of it. However many steps or variables that are in that in the reconditioning process, you need to look at each one of them individually, and they all stand on their own two feet. You, if you have a little bit, a little law or a part of it that's taking longer than the others, that's where you need to dive into and get better at and find solutions and ask your guys what they can do better for you. So before we had Raptor Recon, we thought we were, we were, we were the, the real deal. Absolutely not. We had a lot of work we had to do, and we still have a lot of work to do. But having that tool, we were able to figure out the solutions that have helped us recondition 800 used cars out of a, a shop, and we were able to sell 800 used cars out of our used car lot. So uh, I'll let Ricky keep on going. Well, you know, it's been about 25 minutes so far. I don't want to take up too much time if, if anyone has any questions. But, you know, thinking back on some of the little things that we kind of had to do, you know, Jared and I are in a third generation here. One of our greatest, you know, our greatest asset is the people of this company. And many of the people have been here for a long time. The longer employees work for a dealership, kind of the more the change they are. And to just listen to these younger guys try to tell them what to do different, um, you're met with some resistance. So one of the things that we did is we, we, we found at least one resource that was on the market that really explained this in book form, and that's the book that, that Dale Pollock wrote in 2010 called Velocity 2.0. And, and, and Velocity 2.0, by buying about 20 copies of that and passing it out to everyone who played a significant role in the used car process, and then almost having weekly kind of book report meetings to talk about what they read, 
they at least understood how these cars were being retailed today on the Internet and how important the reconditioning was. The service department also finally opened their eyes and said, oh, I get it. So we get the car to them faster. They sell it faster. They get us another car faster. We can fix more cars every month. Yes, it just makes sense. So your turn increases and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So you, you got the book. Um, and then what our numbers were and what we're at now. Yeah, so, so you know, that you got you to gotta just implement a process. You got to have something in writing that's communicated. Everybody understands. So they know there's expectations. And then you got to find the tools out there that help you measure and, and, and analyze. Because I can sit here and tell you I'm right all day, but if I can get something and actually build a report and show somebody and say, look, here's where we got to get better, it, it makes it that much more con concrete as far as uh, transpiring. So kind of to get to the, the end of the deal here, so let's speak forward for three years. First couple of years were, were rocky um, as we had to figure out the used car pricing along with the reconditioning process. You know, everyone's afraid of that. Oh, I'm going to lose all the growth on my used cars. And, and it did. I, I think 2013, uh, we dipped below 1,000 on the front end. But then first you get the volume up, then the growth comes. And we can see that now. And if you add back in the increase in the growth on the, on the fixed internal, it's actually a higher front end than it was before all of this started. So if you look at it from the big picture like that, so now through the first seven months of this year, uh, we reset a little over 5,000 used cars, and our fixed internal gross is over $3 million. So both of those numbers basically doubled in three years by just simply going faster. And speed is king, and you got to get the tools to make it happen. Um, one of the tools I have is, my personal digital nerd who's sitting here is named Jeremy Tudor, and uh, he's pretty smart in the business. So if anyone has any tech questions about any of the software, the things that we do there, or something from a service or a general sales management side, ask right after Jared says. Uh, one of the okay. biggest things that we ever did best things, when we got rapid recon, which was a spectacular advantage to us, and we were able to dissect and divulge each part of the process. Rather than me just looking at it as a sale or as a service manager and saying I'm just going to fix what I can fix, and Ricky looking at it as a general sales manager as I'm just going to fix what I can fix, and Jeremy is, who manages other people in the, the the sales department looking at it as I'm just going to fix the things that affect me. Each week at two o'clock every Tuesday, everybody that's involved in rapid recon, from the buyers that buy the vehicles, from the ones that and, uh, that uh, the bring the vehicles in at our intake lot, so from the trucks, from the transporters that the vehicles are traded in, from the people that price them, from the service managers to the, the general sales manager of the used car department, everybody that has a step that's involved with rapid recon meets every every week at two o'clock, and we bring up opportunities, and we all help each other figure out a solution, and. The communication that you can get between all parties involved and working to a common goal is unbelievable. And I strongly suggest, out of everything I just talked about, having Rapid Recon initiated the Rapid Recon meeting, and we all concentrate on working to the same goal by communication, not pointing figures at each other. So, Ricky, keep on going, sir. You know, I mean, we could go on and on, but I think that's a lot of... Uh, information and obviously every dealership's different and to kind of apply to a different scale you know we we were trying to kind of grow and see how big the used car market in central Ohio was so we've had a lot of layers of people and things like that but but kind of even on a even on a smaller scale the same same principles apply you know speed first solid process and writing measure it you know look at look at each part of the process and and always strive to get better um, I don't know, is there, is there a way, uh, Brian or Steve or anybody, to actually take questions? Or Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, on the, on the bottom left of everybody's screen, there's a chat function. If you have some questions, please ask them. Actually, I've, I've already got a couple for you. Um, uh, can, can you speak about the production pay versus the hours-based pay for techs? This question is from Jennifer Tucker. Yes, yeah, so what we did is we looked back at a year's worth of production, or uh, a year's worth 
of technician pay. So each vehicle, based off the bucket, we could break it down. So a vehicle having zero to 20,000 miles, on average, had a certain amount of hours attached to each RO. And from 20 to 40,000 miles, had a certain amount of hours attached to each RO. How it broke down is, and this is just all happened by chance, uh, we have the bucket zero to 20,000 miles, 20 to 40,000 miles, 40 to 80,000 miles, and 80,000 miles and plus. So it happened to break down that each vehicle that has zero to 20,000 miles gets paid three hours to the technician. That includes the oil change, uh, air filter, and whatever else work they do. And anything 20 to 40,000 miles gets paid five hours. And then 40 to 80 is seven hours, and 80,000 miles plus is uh, nine hours, so three, five, seven, nine. And at first, you're going to find that, man, I, uh, I don't want to do this, or I'm not going to, I'm not going to fix this. I'm not going to make it to make time on it. And that's when you have to just hold them accountable. And when you have a policy account, and the car comes back after they said that they fixed all they need to be fixed on it, and it's clearly not black and white. They forgot they missed something, and a customer's pissed post sale. You charge them back those hours that they missed on, and that's how you get quality assurance to make sure that they're just not pushing cars in, collecting hours. Did that kind of answer the question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, actually, yeah. Jennifer asked another question. It, it was Velocity. The book is called Velocity yeah. by Dale well, Pollock. Three versions. The first version, the original Velocity that Dale wrote, um, I think it was in 2006 or seven. They came out with Velocity 2.0 in 2010. 2.0 is called Paint, Pixels, and Profitability. The paint and the pixels part have to do with used car velocity, reconditioning, merchandising, pricing, sourcing, all those awesome things. Uh, the third part is kind of Dale's vision into the future. And then he wrote a third book that's called Velocity Overdrive. And I don't want to be too critical because he's a genius of a man, but uh, the overdrive is more of kind of a case study of some certain um, dealerships. I got a lot out of it, but not near as much as Philosophy 2.0. That that kind of became the book that when in a, one of the employees in another department would come up to me and, and ask me something and I knew the answer had to do with philosophy, I would look at him and I would just smile and say, read the book again. It's in the book, you know. So uh, it just helps the communication of how imperative philosophy is throughout the entire company, even the accounting department, title runners, you know, the detailers, the lock guys, the transport companies, getting everybody on the same page that speed is king. Perfect. Yeah. Well, if, if, if nobody else has any questions, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, especially Rick and Jared Reichert. I really appreciate you taking the time to share this information. This has probably been one of the most informative webinars in the Auto Success Series. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks. I, I, I thought that we did a bad job of being organized in the beginning as far as Jared and I's parks. We, we never do this kind of thing. But um, if, if there's any additional questions, if anybody happens to email you guys or, or anybody wants to contact us directly, um, so anybody's free to email or call Jared or myself. Uh, hey, Rick. Anybody. Yeah. Hey, Rick, it's Steve. I had a question. What What do you consider uh, over-reconditioning? How do you prevent that? I can give you the perfect example <laughs> because I'm part of it. <laughs> so a year ago, I bought on-car brake leads for our, our reconditioning shop, two of them. And understand I had nine days in that, in that area. And those on-car brake leads were, were running nonstop because why? Because they got paid, let's just say, an hour and a half to machine of front rotors and then machine of back rotors for another hour and a half or whatever it is. They looked at it as, as an easy way to turn hours. And whether those brakes necessarily needed them or not, I'm pretty sure those brake leads were, were, were being used in fixing those cars because they were paid per vehicle or per hour that they turned. Fast forward, to when they went to the production-based pay plan. When they weren't paid to do a specific repair on each vehicle, those brake lays haven't been uh, have dust on them because they're not being used right now. Um, per, a classic example of it, it might need it, it might not need it, but I'm just going to do it. 
Got it. That makes perfect yeah, sense. From, a, from kind of a used car standpoint also, you know, everybody knows that, that one that one car that they want to trade in and, you know, you appraise it for, for, for 12 grand and customer wants more and it is clean and it looks pretty and you kind of drove it around the lot and you're like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and put 13 grand in this car even though wholesale is, you know, 12 five. And the next thing you know, service comes back and tells you, man, this thing needs shocks and struts and brakes all the way around. It actually needs head gaskets. It needs, I mean, three, $3,500 $3, worth of mechanical. Now you're looking, you're going to have 17 grand in that car? What are you going to do with it? Can't we tell it? Well, with our system, it goes on, it goes in the bucket system. So now all of a sudden, you're going to get the 900 or the 1200 or whatever that set dollar amount is. And even though service, it looks like, like, why would service do that? Well, the next five cars they get are going to be below what that, that, that bucket line is. And at the end of the month, they average it. And we have some months where there's a little bit of an overage and some months where it's a little bit under. But the more time you give the program to run, it all, it all ends up working itself out. Right. Are there? Do you have limits in the mileage buckets as to what you should spend on a car, or is it? It just keeps going. No, eighty, eighty. We we say eighty and up. It's really eighty to one hundred and thirty. We talk about the amount of money that we're willing to spend. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. It's, the it's, service department knows it's just a bad car. Like, man, this thing's a turd. It's got so many things wrong with it. You know, do we? And and Jared will call, or you know, somebody asks the question. Can we send this thing to auction? It's just at that point where, you know, and and honestly, then you got to go to the appraisers or the guys buying the car and saying, hey, if you really drove this car, you knew that it had more wrong with it than what generally would be wrong with that car with that many miles. You should have allowed some more money. Got it. So, you know, you got to have the. You you still have to have people that are smart to know how to make a good decision. but but generally most of the time you can you can you can assume that most cars will just fit the system. Right. I just, hey, another I just, another another question. Um, the system and the things that we've talked about. How uh, is that that's going to work, or how is that going to work for dealers that are turning you know a hundred one hundred and fifty cars or even less? Oh man, I wish I would have known of this in two thousand five, six, seven. I. I ran a used car lot that we sold 100 to 150 a month. And especially from the standpoint of that size of a store, used car manager kind of does everything. I mean, he's, you know, you don't, you know, we, 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 we've got the privilege of having an intake manager and, you know, a buying center manager that, that could review the service estimates. Well, a used car manager does it all at a store that size. So you're up there desking deals, closing customers, and trying to approve service bills and stuff. It, you know, whatever you can make it easiest by doing simple reporting and, and knowing exactly which car is in which step in the process, you can catch those flags faster. Um, and I would, it, it would, I, I don't think it would be any different. You just have less people um, and you'd have to wear multiple hats. You know, you'd have to have somebody that is responsible for two or three of the steps rather than just one. So, and, I get and like, anything the simpler you can keep it because most dealerships don't employ a lot of college graduates you know or you don't have to be too smart to be in this business so so to keep it simple and to just have those you know easy steps that are communicated with what the expectations are and then hold people accountable um, I think it'd be easier on a smaller scale and you'd probably see success faster you know it took us a solid two years of kind of growing pains and getting things to work before we could finally look at, you know, talk at the end of the month and go, wow, this thing's working. Cool. You know, so I think in a smaller store, uh, it actually works works better. Yeah. Okay, Bye. Rick. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Brian, okay. do we have actually, I, I, um, actually, nope. That, that Jennifer also said, nice job, guys. Um, yeah, that, it looks like that's all the questions that we have. Um, I, actually, I have one question. Um, Jared, you had mentioned that, you know, a, a situation where a tech might have a, a, a real trouble car where he's, you know, he's getting paid 10 hours on a 50-hour week, 
does that happen often? I mean, I can see how across the board for the entire department, you know, it, the, all the averages are going to even out. But, but I mean, do, have you had experiences where one guy just gets unlucky and, and he ends up with, with very little hours for the, for the month because he's got four, four bad cars? Um, not that often. I think uh, since we started it since January, you know, we basically gave it the option up to them, you know, if they're uh, – if they're having a bad week, they, they get like a get out of jail free card. We're going to take care of them. I think it's happened a total. I mean, just under, understand the precondition. How many thousands of cars already this year? I think it's probably happened twelve times. Oh uh, wow! Okay. Wow. But but then again, then again, I mean, if they're doing a transmission, we're going to pay them the hours that it costs to do the transmission, and we're going to adjust adjust the bucket so it'll go towards the stock number of the vehicle. You know, that's where your your communication line has to be open with the sales department saying, hey, this vehicle needs a transmission. Do you want to fix it? Do you want to fix the auction? Okay, we're building it to the stock unit. We're not throwing it towards the bucket because that's normal maintenance repairs or normal reconditioning repairs that we're throwing a $5,000 fix in there to throw off the numbers. Okay. I got you. Well, cool. Hey, it looks... Oh, Leonard says, well put together, got on late, but I'm glad I made it to get the majority of the webinar. Um, and and, and I, for everybody on, on the webinar, um, I had a little bit of technical difficulty, so the recording didn't start until about five minutes in. Um, but I do have the recording from five minutes in and beyond. So if anybody you know, had, to, had to take a phone call or miss something or would like to review this again, please shoot me an email. My email is brian, B-R-I-A-N, at autosuccessonline.com, and I'll happily forward you over a link to, to watch the webinar again. Um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to add? All right. Hey, well, just like, uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Rick Records. Really appreciate thanks. it. Rick and Jared, we really appreciate it. Uh, we'd love to have you on again. Uh, Steve, appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, everybody. You got it. Thank thanks, you. thanks, Brian. All right, guys. Good. So a lot thanks. of cars. <laughs> All right, bye.